And we're uh, recording once again. So thanks, everyone, for joining me for another one of these uh, webinar sessions. Uh, and I've said before, and every single time I start one of these things, I say, holy cow, uh, I can't believe all the great guests that I've been able to line up. I'm actually going to be interviewing even uh, Bishop Robert Barron uh, in May on, on this show. Uh, and uh, I've had Sh David Schindler and uh, and various, you know, uh, people from New Polity. And, and so I'm just really, really happy today to add to that list of celebrities. I have a, a, a sort of an old colleague friend. We haven't really met that many times, maybe two or three times at various conferences. But I, 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 I don't know why, but I share this sort of feel like this psychological sort of connection to you i think I, I think we have similar personalities i don't know maybe not anyway who am i talking about i'm talking about the one and only dr lewis Ayers, uh who has uh sort of taught it all over the place you taught in ireland you taught in the yep. united states at emory he's now a professor of catholic and historical theology at the university of durham in the UK, I've never been to Durham. I've been to Oxford and London. Uh, my daughter went to Newcastle, so I've been in Newcastle. I once asked my daughter, "What's the weather like in Newcastle?" And she said, <laughs> uh, "Horizontal." <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, and I didn't believe her until I visited and thought, oh, "Dear God in heaven, that's how I lost my hair." Uh, yeah. It was all Newcastle, and yeah, but so you've you've been sort of all over. But before we get into theology. Yeah precisely because you're in the uk all right i am a huge huge fan of fish and chips i'm an aficionado <laughs> of fish and chips yeah. i love fish and chips. eat it every day so i've eaten it all over the world i have an opinion about whether the irish mm. or the brits have better fish and chips now before i give you my mm. opinion what say ye since you've lived in both countries i'm assuming maybe you like fish and chips i don't know well i do I I have a great grandmother who was from Cork, so oh. I feel divided loyalties. Um, I think probably good Irish fish and chips is better. Answered correctly, sir. Yes, that's it. <laughs> I no, I've... danger of losing my passport, but I'll. <laughs> <laughs> I just found I thought well let's put this way I've had fish and chips in Oxford and London and I think the the English and I can't speak for the Scots or whatever but the English. Yeah. Hmm. prefer their fish and chips to be a little greasier than I than than I would care for uh and the Irish a little less greasy but maybe that's a purely subjective impression on my part I don't know well I think but it, I think it's related to the general inability of uh, British people to cope with capitalism right <laughs> so we basically think it's a good idea that you ought to do shit and make money out of it the trouble is that we're also capable of resenting anyone that asks us to do anything. So like you, you open a fish and chip shop and you make an effort for the first week. And for the first week, it's wonderful. And then you think these people are asking me to do something that's inappropriate. And so you begin, the service begins the decline. Things get worse and worse. The chips get greasier. There's this sense of why are you bothering me? I own this store. Leave me alone, I'm <laughs> waiting for the revolution. And then it sort of declines. And this happens with every British business. So I think it's to do with the British inability to cope with capitalism. We just can't keep up good service. So you need to find a fish and chip shop that has just opened. Well, that's a that's good there advice go. for the next time I'm in the UK, probably post COVID. But uh, I never thought in a million years that a simple lead in question about fish and chips would lead to a discussion of the British and capitalism yeah, and capitalism yeah. um yeah. wasn't rh tawney the economist british i can't remember now he wrote i think the, so yes yeah he wrote that famous book the acquisitive society but anyway that's not why i have you on uh <laughs> although we could talk about everything what what uh dr Ayers is is most known for uh, for those of my guests who are not familiar with this thought, well, he's known for a lot of things, but he knows the patristic era extremely well. And I have not yet had a patristic scholar on this show. So I really wanted to invite him on. In particular, he's he's an expert in the Trinitarian theology of St. Augustine. He's an expert really just in general, the fourth century uh, Greek thought and the development of Trinitarian theology. He's an expert in the development of scriptural notions of exegesis and interpretation. Uh, basically in, in the very early church uh, and the emergence of the very concept of scripture. Uh, 
geez, what 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 haven't you? Oh, you also you're fond of race horse month theology, but you agree with me apparently that it is very much an unfinished project. Um, it's and- it's an unfinished project, and in some some vital ways, it failed, and that's particularly, I think, evident with its attempt to make patristic theology a sort of living voice in the contemporary church, weirdly. Um, One of the things it's most known for, it most strongly failed. Okay, so why don't don't we start with that? I was going to sort of end with that, but let's start with that because that might be the gateway drug into into some of the other other conversation because I share that point of view. Uh, the resource month theologians were sort of very good at talking about incorporating mm-hmm. patristics and scripture and stuff into their theology, but they didn't always often do so, especially in 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 properly non anachronistic ways and in ways that were truly integrated uh, in, into a cohesive theological vision, uh, and and so. In many ways, I think that's an unfinished project. But maybe I think that because I've been out of the academic guild now really for about eight years, even though I still read. Um, are there resource month theologians out there, Lewis, doing what it is that you think they should be doing? Young ones that I am, young Turks coming up to the ranks that I'm not aware of? I, I don't really know. I don't really know. I think that the system, the way the field is organized, almost prevents people doing that. Okay, so I think you could address this story or my view of this story from either end. You could ask, why is the Theological Guild preventing people doing a properly resource mon theology now? Or you could say, what went wrong in the 50s and 60s? Um, Now, probably what went wrong in the 50s and 60s is really important, I think, to understand as background. So, you've okay. got, you know, this host of figures, many of whom we we jointly revere, people like de Lubac and Yves Congar, um, uh, Cardinal Daniel Lu. Um, and these were great figures um, who found themselves needing to recover the voice of early Christian thought because they thought that it spoke to modern people that it would really uh, revitalize some of the structures of theology over against a neo-Thomism they didn't like. Um, and to some extent, they had some sort of success. They founded series, the most famous of which is the, the French series, Source Chrétien, which was right. supposed to be a series of translations putting these early voices uh, into the hands of uh, that, that wonderful category, the interested layperson as well as theologians. Um, And they also, if you look at some of their effect on the documents of Vatican II, there really is a sort of conscious use sometimes of patristic phraseology and terminology. It's great. But if you look who in the generation after them or who among them in the decade after the council started, say, writing a Trinitarian theology that was focused on patristic sources, there's a sudden silence, the tumbleweeds blow across the street. <laughs> now, now yeah. why is that? And I think it's, but I think it's for a host of reasons. I think it's that their, their voices were heard after the council into a situation that had already given itself over to increasing subdisciplinary specialization in theology, uh, the rise of a modern systematic theology that was replacing dogmatics and became just arranging pieces on the modern chessboard rather than anything else. Patristics became a sort of much more technical subject for people who had a rare education in philology and Latin and Greek. Um, And so they didn't actually, Danielou, uh, de Lubac, these people, Congar, didn't really speak into a situation where there was an obvious training ground for anyone to take this forward and do something. Um, and it, it faded, I think. Um, I think you're right. Um, obviously, there are a lot of modern post-conciliar or somewhat pre-conciliar uh, Catholic theologians who did write, uh, say, rather substantive Trinitarian theology. Yeah. I, mean, I I did my dissertation on essentially the metaphysical 
Trinitarian mm-hmm. ontological volumes of Hansors von Balthasar's yep. aesthetic and bits and pieces of his theodrama. Um, I was wondering, would you consider, say, someone like him or, or somebody like a Walter Casper's book, The God of Jesus Christ, or some of the other Trinitarian theo- are, are would they fall under what you would consider simply arranging the pieces ba- on Balthazar the Balthazar t- is a special case. Okay, let's let's bracket <laughs> Balthazar for two minutes because then we yeah okay remember. yeah he's okay. sort of sui generis. Yeah, Casper et al. Not really, and I think that's because of the way in which they write about pre-modern figures. They don't write about pre-modern figures as if they are listening to them as authoritative voices, trying to learn from them. They tend to approach them as people who have good nuggets of information as long as you can translate it in some way as long as you can wade through the mythical crap you can so they mine it. it yeah you can mine it for something so they're yeah. not really read as as figures to whom one should be devoted as well as critical in a scholarly way and it's that balance that's important and i think you know the the parallel is thinking about how do modern readers of Thomas work. Um, I'm not a Thomist, but I will come to this eventually. I think that the sort of revival in Thomism is actually really important for the church, because there you have a category of people who read Thomas as a saint, as a teacher of the church, and yet increasingly they do so also critically, looking at what he's saying in the context of his time, looking at different interpretations of his thought, locating him as a historical figure and yet one deserving deserving of reverence. And I think that developing those compatible skills, those skills which should go together, has been a problem. For a lot of modern systematic theologians, patristics is something you mine, or something about which you make grand claims that don't really stand up, because you're not reading those figures as if they're primary dialogue partners in the conversation. Right. You know, they're, they're historians. Yeah. You know? I, 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 I think you're absolutely correct for uh, uh, about everything that you just said. Uh, but uh, especially with regard to the failure of the, re- the 20th Century Resource Month theologians, I think that in many, many ways they were so focused on slaying the neo-scholastic manualist dragon and would mine the fathers and even just mine the scriptures mm-hmm. in a sense for... Uh, whatever useful little, like you said, nuggets they could find in order to sort of bring down that neo-scholastic edifice. And, but it was almost as if once that edifice collapsed and then you get the revolution after mm-hmm. the council, it's almost as if the resource Mont guys sort of looked around and said, what the hell did we just do? <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and sort of retreated to it. Mean, okay. We started communio and yeah. we still well you know... had two reactions didn't you you had two reactions you know one is the delubak what the hell did we do yeah yeah and then you had the congar reaction which is just to reach for your guitar and your sociology book uh, <laughs> and off you go um and you're a bit yeah. stuck but then uh... none of those people i mean congar was the closest to be fair none of those people was really a dogmatic theologian someone who was going to sit down and and really write hard on one of those topics i mean Congar from time to time, but he's a more, much more complex figure because in some ways he traveled the furthest, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I think he did too. Uh, now, Balthazar. Yeah. Okay, okay. Is a really Balthazar. Case. Right, let's do Balthazar. Because um, he's written a lot of monographs on church fathers and things like that, but he's accused of being very idiosyncratic in his reading. Well, I mean, three things are the case. One, there's a really interesting debate about whether Balthazar is a central resource mon figure or not, which I, I think is actually really significant. So there's a whole school of people of whom uh, I think the most important is uh, Cyril O'Regan at Yale, uh, yeah. who really treat Balthazar as the the er resource mon figure, just to combine our languages. Um, because and I, but they do that because he is the systematic one. He's the one who could put together that that beautiful synthesis. Um, but in some ways, that by itself makes him a non resource mon figure, because the other guys weren't even interested in doing that. They didn't know how to do it, and he could do it because he was so versed in a certain sort of German literary tradition, 
Yeah. So I, I, I'm happy to call him a cousin. He's a resourceman cousin. <laughs> that's the first point. Is he really a resourceman figure? Yes and no. Uh, secondly, I don't know of anyone who ever read Balthazar and thought, wow, I better go and do patristics. Exactly. That's the interesting thing about Balthazar. What you read Balthazar and you think, damn, I'm going to write some books about Balthazar. Um, and that, and some of them are great. You know, look, there's chap there. He wrote a book. Buy his book. Um, and, that, and, and that's not a bad thing because Balthazar was obviously a uniquely generative mind. Um, the man's a genius. Some of it's wonderful. But he is very much by his, by his life story and his corpus, he's an individual who's able to stand above what 99% of other theologians of real gifts can do. And he produces this synthesis, which does stand, but it's an oddly isolated synthesis in some ways. Um, yeah, and it's, yeah. not, it's not led to people doing patristics any more than um, people reading de Lubac's medieval exegesis has made medievalists. Um, what it makes is systematicians who like the idea of reading some allegory. Um, but are slightly <laughs> worried what will happen when their department chairs find out. Um, so yeah, yeah Balth the second thing about Balthazar is this sort of fascinating uniqueness of Balthazar. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think that's one of the most interesting things. You think, well, who in the 20th century do I point to as my model? Um, if it's Balthazar, you're likely to become a Balthazar scholar or to write what? in the style of Balthazar. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah, his I, success and failure, I think. I hope I don't write in his style, although <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm capable of writing in his no. style. Uh, and that's, and I, that in itself is a gift, Larry. And I, and I did, I did uh, contemplate suicide on numerous occasions uh, as I was translating his German. <laughs> I mean, my dissertation director was the late, great Edward Oakes. And, of blessed memory. Uh, yeah, of blessed memory. And I was very content to just base my dissertation on the, the, the aesthetic, mm -hmm. which had been yeah. translated into mm -hmm. English. Uh, even though I, I could read German, uh, I didn't want to have to do it in a way that was reliable enough for a dissertation. Yeah. So I want and Ed Oaks insisted, no, 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 no. You need to do it in German and you need to read all the stuff that hasn't been translated in German. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah I, I, I had no, no, no desire to emulate his writing style after I got done with all of that. And one, but I but I think you're absolutely correct about something, um, whether or not. Now, I'm going to be interviewing Cyril O'Regan next month, actually. So mm. I, I'll, I'll talk to him about this. Um, and I love his stuff on Balthazar. But uh, there. Balthazar was, it, there's an article, an essay, I can't remember which one it is now, it's in Comunio somewhere, where he is labeling himself, he's talking about the various categories of Catholic theology, and he's labeling himself, and he does not include himself in with the mm -hmm. Danielus and Shenus yeah. and Duluba. He includes himself with converts like Bouye which I thought yeah. was really interesting that he deliberately eschewed, eschewed the, 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 the designation yeah. resource Mont and said, no, I'm more in this other camp over here, which I can't remember if he gave it a name or not, but he just said like Bouye. And it, what, what, what's interesting about that is that he would not, I guess, have considered Bouye to be a resource Mont yeah. thinker too, but some other kind of thinker, which yeah. only goes to show how fluid these categories are absolutely yeah um so anyway i want to discuss before we get to augustine i, I want to talk about yeah. augustine and his trinitarian theology because lately i've been on this huge augustine kick and i i sort of rediscovered augustine in my old age uh and and realized god the dude was a genius and why haven't mm. i been re reading him more often but um i want to i want to talk about scripture and, okay uh, and i want to talk about the history in the in the like maybe starting around 150 mm -hmm. and, and going up to maybe the Council of Nicaea. What yeah. was going on in the church during that period before the sort of official formation of the New Testament? What kind of in other words, there's there's a whole narrative out there that it was just kind of a mess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And that it took a sort of act of authority two or three hundred years later to sort of impose order on this mess. Yeah, yeah. Is, what I is, call it, 
what I call right. students the smorgasbord approach. Yes. There are, there are many Christianities. They're all sitting on a table. There's lots of guys sitting around saying, let's just, you know, there was this Jesus dude. Let's let's make up a version. And so you've got six or seven different versions all sitting on a table. And eventually along comes the Emperor Constantine who says, we'll have that one. And if you don't like it, here's a sword. Um, <laughs> and so and that's and, you know, and that's how you get orthodoxy. Um, well, that that's that's a useless picture, really. It's not historically sustainable. I mean, I think there are there there has been a move to recognize the plurality of early Christianity, especially in the second century, in the century immediately after uh, the resurrection. Um, and and to, to some extent, that's not bad uh, in the same way that, you know, of, officially, when we talk about apostolic succession, we recognize that knowing exactly what a bishop was, who appointed them, how you talk about these successions in the, the first 150 years after Christ is actually a remarkably complex process. Yeah. We don't any longer take an old apologetic line and sort of imagine um, uh, ceremonies that we would have recognized going on all the way through the second century. Uh, that's, and that's fine. You know, we're just becoming more historically respectable. So we have to recognize that in the second century. So, you, so you're talking right. about kind of like that pipeline view of. Yeah, the pipeline view of apostolic succession. OK, right. we, we right. recognize that some of that doesn't really is not yeah. really the case. Uh, yeah. that it's much more complex than that. But that's fine. Yeah. Um, there are ways around that. But one of the most important things happening in that period, which I think really helps you to provide helps to provide a basis on which to think about unity as well as uh, difference in the period is the emergence of scripture. Now, one way to think about the emergence of scripture is simply in terms of books is to say, OK, for Jesus and Paul, scripture meant the Hebrew scriptures. It meant the Jewish scriptures about which there was some doubt exactly what was in, what was out, but it meant an, a basically established canon of Jewish scriptures. Right. And then at various points over the next couple of hundred years, some more got added to the list of books until you had the New Testament in this book and the Old Big Testament in that book. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the only question which matters is which books are in, which books are out, when did it happen? Um. But that's actually not a very helpful way of looking at it. Um, can, can I interrupt one second? Yeah. What version of the Old Testament was most predominant during this time? The Septuagint in Greek or the Masoretic, the Hebrew Masoretic text? Uh, probably the Septuagint. Okay. Certainly among Christians, right? Because yeah, you're right. One of the, it, it seems that one of the reasons for um, the increasing significance of the Masoretic text uh, in a Hebrew context, in a Jewish context, was Christian use of the Septuagint. Right. So they're, they're deeply interwoven choices. Um, so you've got you've got Christians with a scripture, right, in, say, yeah. the year 100. But when they talk about scripture, they mean the Jewish scriptures. And what they're doing is doing what Christ did, which is to interpret Christ by means of the Jewish scriptures. OK, so right. on, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus is explaining himself by means of the Jewish scriptures. Right. Paul preaching in Acts two and three is explaining what's happening to the disciples by means of the Jewish scriptures. So that was how theology was done. And then you had the writing of other texts by Christians, you know, uh, particularly early, we've got Paul's letters, and then we've got gradually the Gospels being written. Um, so you've got these other texts being written by Christians and gradually spreading around the Christian world. And those texts seem to be used in public acts of worship fairly early on. And it's that yeah, right. publicness that's important. So people are reading out Paul's letters. Or they're reading out uh, as, uh, bits of the Gospels that they have, or maybe the whole text. So the way in which texts become important is by them being read publicly and used as a matter of argument among Christians and interpretation. Okay. Um, 
Right. It's quite natural that that, you know, that that happens. They sit alongside the Jewish scriptures. But something really significant happens during the course of the second century, the years uh, of the, especially in the sort of period between 150 and 200. And that is they, the scriptures get read in a certain way, because how you read a book tells us everything about what sort of book you think it is. OK, you pick up a phone book and uh, but no, nobody picks up a phone book anymore. But OK, <laughs> Jeff and I are old enough to remember a phone. We book. remember those. I remember those. Right. You open the thing and there's all these numbers that, you know, are in such tiny writing that people of our age can't actually read them. And there are the names beside them. And you want to find chap. So you look down under the seas. OK, and you find the number and then you, you dial the number. Well, that actually on a rotary me. phone, on a rotary phone. Yes. <laughs> OK. And it's connected with a, with a little. Yeah. OK, great. Yeah. Um, but that tells you something about what the book is. You assume that that book is just a provider of basic information. Right. right. The way in which you read that book is pretty much like the way you read a manual for a washing machine. You're just looking for information. You don't read it, opening it and think this is a sacred text. It, it, in the little no. commercial yeah. underneath chap's name, I will find an allegory which will tell me about the nature of angels. You don't do that unless, you know, you need help. What you're doing is just reading a manual. Yeah. But what what happens with um, scriptures, the Christian scriptures, towards the end of the second century is that Christians begin to agree a way of reading them. They begin to say, everything here is significant. Everything here has been given to us by the spirit. It's not just say that we extract from this the sayings of Jesus, which certainly happened earlier. We don't just extract the sayings of Jesus. We read everything that's said. So we assume that the spirit has somehow inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke or John to write this and when we want to argue about what jesus meant we look at what is said across the spread of these texts okay so right. christians begin to involve not simply which books they read but how they will read them and it's that that really fixes the character of christianity as a scriptural revision uh, religion that's Does, really significant I point. would assume, too, and this is germane to, to, to the conversation, is that it would help to also fix what later became the canon. Yes. Once you once you say in order to know what this text means, I have to look across the canon and find out how that expression is used. That forces you to begin to think about the boundaries of the canon. Um, so I think that yeah. the, the reading technique is every bit as important as just saying, what should we do? Um, which book would you like to be in? Now, I think in a lot of cases, you also in the second century get the sense that there there is already existing a pretty serious, clear sense of the core list of books that right. you can read out on a Sunday morning or whenever you're having your Eucharist. You know, um, it isn't the case that there's a, you know, there's a massive list of books and you don't really know what to do. It is the case that the core books are there. Now, that brings me to the, I mean, yeah. okay, are, are the core books considered core books because of their liturgical usage, as you just said, and or, I mean, is, is, the, is the aspect of apostolic origin in whatever fashion, am I anachronistically as a Catholic apologist wanting to read into that period that they were concerned about such things or were they concerned about that? You know, part of the problem is that the evidence is really lacking. So a really famous yeah. example and one that uh, critics of the sort of thing I'm saying would make a lot of is that this, there's this bishop, Serapion of Antioch and a famous, the greatest of early church historians, Eusebius recounts this story Eusebius is writing about the year 300. He's writing about a story he's encountered in letters going back to the sort of 180s. And Serapion is the Bishop of Antioch. He's visited this uh, village and he's found them reading out something called the Gospel of Peter. Right. Okay. 
Right. And he's like, hmm, what do we do about this? And there's two ways to take the story. One way is to st- is to notice that he says, well, I wasn't really too concerned about that, but I had to cut out some bits which seemed heretical, basically. Right. And that can give you the impression that no one had a sense of what was scriptural. Right. He just thought the yeah. name is Peter attached to it. Yeah. That's hunky dory. Off we go. But in fact, if you read what Eusebius tells us, it's more interesting than that, because uh, what Serapion did was to compare it with the fourfold gospel. There you go. Yeah. Now, he doesn't say why the four gospels are authentic. He just says, well, there they are. And I think that's partly because it's for a number of reasons. It's partly because... um, they have been used liturgically for so long, so they're just obviously there. It's partly also that despite what you would get if you read some sorts of popular anti-Christian um, writings, um, there isn't an endless set of Gospels available for people to pick from. It's true. You know, and that that's, is often overlooked. Um, and thirdly, apostolic origin may be you know, wound up within that as well. Um, you know, there there is a one of the one of the people who's most fun to read about this is actually the reform scholar Charles Hill. Uh, Chuck Hill has just reform just retired from Reform Theological Seminary in Orlando, but he wrote this wonderful popularish book called Who Wrote the Gospels. Um, now, some of it's a little over the top, and it's a little reformed for me because he's absolutely determined to defend a reformed Christianity out of it. You know, well, good for him. We know he's wrong, but he's he's 75 percent right. And he's the one who who gives a lovely example of um, (laughs) of, well, you know, there's a common story often repeated in textbooks that people were very uncertain about the Gospel of John. And he goes through the evidence and shows you there's almost nothing behind this story at all. you have these reports towards the end of the second century where people talk about the fourfold gospel. Yeah. They're not really defending it. They're just saying, and there it is. It's a fait accompli at that yeah. point. These are the four gospels. That, you know, yes, there are texts like Hebrews, Revelation, which were the matter of dispute. But the yeah. core of what became Christian scriptures emerged almost inevitably, I think, from... Uh, the history of the second century. There were Gospels parallel to those. We have two or three fragments that we can't really identify that are very, very early. But actually, I think they're very few in number. Yeah, maybe the leading candidate uh, would would be a certain proto-Gospel of Thomas, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So what's the Gospel of Thomas who wrote it when? Very difficult to say. But basically, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were there from a very early date. They were frequently used or alluded to. They emerged as the core uh, of the the New Testament during the second century. And the development of a way of reading those texts made Christianity into the scriptural revision religion that it yeah. is today. Very interesting. I'm, I'm thinking. Are you familiar with uh, Richard Balcom's book? You know, Eyewitness yeah. to Jesus. Uh, yeah. What do you What do you think of of his take on this same sort of question well, that we're talking that, that, i think that's pretty good i mean i think that you know there are sort of two sides to borkham both of which are quite important one is his recognition as a new testament scholar that the gospels are not simply each written for a community but yes they're written for the church and that's that they were circular yeah yeah they, mean, they the circulated and they were intended that, to be you know, so yeah. we've got four because each one represents the voice of a different community there's no real evidence for that. I mean, you know, it may have entertained a, a, a generation of New Testament scholars, Catholic and, uh, and non-Catholic. But uh, I think Borkham's right to say, no, there's not really anything in that. These are texts written for the church and circulated amongst these sort of small churches as they grew up in the late first century and then on. Um, and then on the other side, I think Borkham's emphasis on the way in which these are intended to be quasi historical accounts of what happened um, using canons of evidence that would be recognizable to their peers, I think is quite important. Um, 
once you get the emergence in the second century of Christian apologists of trying to show that Christianity is a rational religion to uh, the Roman world, um, they quite easily, I think, and naturally draw on the idea that our scriptures are A, ancient, because we're using the Jewish scriptures, and B, our records of what Jesus says are, are quite plausible and reliable. Um, so yeah. I think Borkham's really, um, really useful in the way that he's looked at those sorts of questions. I, I, I just know, I don't know, I'm not a New Testament scholar or even a historian of the period, but I remember reading his book and being quite impressed with, yeah. with, the, with the case that he makes that the Gospels were written with a kind of encyclical quality mm -hmm. about them and yeah. that they were written actually to be uh, far more historical and even in a modern sense of historical than, yeah. what we would, than what we would give them credit for. Now, I'm sure there are critics and all that. And, I, and I'm not saying all this in order to undermine your fundamental um, mm -hmm. Uh, exegesis of of how the process worked out mm -hmm. essentially liturgically mm -hmm. doxologically because i tend to agree with that um but i'm thinking for example of the criticisms of someone like a bart Ehrman or an elaine pagels who would say well dr Ayers, your argument is ultimately kind of circular isn't it that well of course those gospels come to be accepted because they're the ones that 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 reinforce yeah. what the church actually has come yeah. to believe and they therefore have excluded those very authentic gospels that just don't happen to line up with their theology um and of course the standard response to that would be yes but those gnostic gospels have real no no real claim to first century yeah no, well i think there are two responses if someone tells me my argument is circular the first thing to say is, yeah, but some circles are vicious and some vir are virtuous spirals. So the fact yeah. that it's a circular argument doesn't mean anything as long as it's critically conducted. I mean, I, that's the easiest accusation. But Absolutely. It's also true that you really do. I mean, the people like Bart uh, who most want to say Bart Ehrman, who most want to yeah. say there's a plurality of Christianities in the second century. So, you know, Gnostic Gospels are just to be ranked alongside, spread out on the table like a book display at a boring conference. They're, they're, they're sort of spread out as if you can choose whichever ones you want. At a certain snapshot in time, you might say, you know, if you were visiting uh, Rome in 180, yes, you would have been able to collect together a whole series of books claiming to be Gospels. Um, but we can say more than that historically. Right. With the exception of the Gospel of Thomas, whatever it is, all of those Gnostic Gospels pretty clearly came along later than the yeah. ones that we now think of as the canonical Gospels. So they don't just sit side by side. Right. So I think we have to fight back a bit. We can be critical, critically historical as well as not just giving in to the endless plurality of Christianity's model. Um, yeah, which is why to their arguments, Bart Ehrman's argument is so critical for their argument to essentially say, we don't know when the Gospels were written. For all we know, they weren't written yeah. until 120 or 125 yeah. or 130. And and uh, yeah. and I think that there's very little historical credibility. Yeah, you, to you those can sorts smoke of what you want and end up saying some stuff and that's great. Yeah, but it's not really sustainable historically, I think. You know, I'm just I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I'm just yeah, giving yeah. these other voices a chance to, to speak so that to hear. I've always been curious. I'd love to get Bart Ehrman and Lewis Ayers in a, <laughs> in a, in a cage match where you yeah. where you He's have a fun to guy. I like Bart. He's actually good to have a drink with. I've never met him personally. Yeah. I've seen him speak, you know, via, you know, YouTube and that. Yeah. And I would imagine yeah. that he would be a <laughs> he'd be a rather raucous drinking buddy, I think. Yeah, he's a uh, great guy. I mean, he's a bit boring when you get on this topic, you know. You know, <laughs> you are dealing with someone who started out at the Moody Bible Institute and has worked his way. Well, is yeah, I know that's I, I've avoided saying that because I, I don't know him personally. And yeah. that's a sort of standard trope that yeah. his critics use. Right. That he's just a fundamentalist who became a different kind of fundamentalist, just on yeah. the opposite side of the spectrum. But I think so that's I'm, true. I think no, I'm happy I, to say that as someone who who's had fun with Bart, it's true. He's just okay, fun, good. That's then you okay. have confirmed the trope and I will yeah. use it again. It'll become yeah. a meme someday. But I actually, before we move on, you know, I, I, what time is it? Oh, geez. But anyway, I think that 
despite all the thicket of things we've talked about here, I think the the really interesting thing I think that I want my viewers to sort of sink their teeth into is is your insight that how those first Christians read the scriptures is of vital importance. And then to what, when they read the scriptures essentially as a kind of doxology, mm. uh, to be read in the light of the doxology that is the Old Testament, and yeah. then to have that put to liturgical use, I think this is of such critical importance because I think a lot of modern day Christians read the Bible like a phone book. Yeah, no, I think this is right. And I think it's really important for us to discover multiple ways of reading the Bible. Okay, yeah, yeah, so this yeah. is a book. This is a book that's given to us and it performs multiple functions. Um, to some extent, yeah, it tells us about Christ. It tells us about the early church. It provides us with details, many of which I think are you know plausible historical material. It's, it's great. But at the same time, it's a book that we read in the spirit, the spirit that animates the church. And so it continues to speak to us. The Hebrew scriptures, yes, they tell us about Israelite religion. They're also a series of texts used by, you know, the continuing Jewish community about whom we should have, for whom we should have the greatest of respect. And yet they're also our scriptures and we read them in the light of Christ. Otherwise, yeah. they're not really our scriptures. So we need to learn to read scripture in different ways, I think. And this is true of both Old and New Testaments. Um, if you can't read them as the fathers read them, then it becomes very difficult to see why we would have Christian doctrine and teaching in the way that we do, or Christian liturgy in the way that we do, which is often made up of readings of texts and combinations of texts which go back to the early church yeah you know when people That's... stand up at mass um recite the creed and say begotten not made okay yeah it's a lovely example i always give to students which text in the new testament or old testament are they appealing to which differentiates the two the answer is they're not what they're doing is picking two key biblical terms and differentiating them in the light of Christ and in the experience of the church's witness. Yeah. You have to accept that that's the way the scriptures are read to get the sort of fullness of how Christian teaching has flowered over the, the centuries, I think. Well, then that brings me to St. Augustine. Yay! All right. Uh, because you you brought up the sort of the creed and the, something yeah. that alludes to Trinitarian theology. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I probably have in my brain a false view of Augustine's Trinitarian doctrine, because when I was in graduate studies, yeah. I learned that Augustine's Trinitarian doctrine was a kind of oh. was a kind of Platonized thing. There it is. There it is, the great book. I wish I had that book. I'm going to have to buy that book. Now you've forced me to buy it. I have your book on Nicaea. And um, so anyway, so wh wh why, why is that wrong? Um, well, it's not wrong to say that Augustine was a Platonist. Okay. True. I mean, one of the really important achievements, he says, to be provocative, of the early Christian period was to find ways of using insights from the Platonist tradition for Christian ends. Uh, I don't think this is something we should apologize for. It's something we should celebrate. Um, it doesn't mean that most pagan Platonists would not have looked at Christian Platonists and said, that is just nonsense. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the really interesting things. Christians like Augustine are using the Platonic tradition but they're yeah. using it for Christian ends. And pagan Platonists would have shook their heads and said, you have no idea what you're talking about. But that's right. one of the great triumphs, I think, of the church uh, using uh, a culture. The spoils of Egypt. Exactly. The spoils of Egypt, usefully used by the fathers. Damn, I sound traditional today. Um, I, I have that effect on people, I guess. Yeah, you we do. Can, yeah, yeah I, I can... I can provoke you to be more outrageous if you want, but go ahead. Yeah, you, we shouldn't, because I'll wake up in the morning and it'll all be on tape. 
um yeah it'll be all over youtube lewis airs yeah. denies the trinity or something Yay. yeah yeah um <laughs> not that you would let's no, make that clear no. yeah uh, uh so anyway so what is what is anyway augustine... so what is it but the other the other thing is there's the you know the old trope of augustine begins by talking about god as one uh whereas Greece that's what i meant that's what i meant begin by talking yeah. about god as three what the hell does begin mean okay it doesn't mean begin in the sense that they both wrote books called Intro to the Trinity. And chapter one says there's really three of them rather than one. And Augustine says, no, no, there's one. Right now, I'm being flippant, but it's really important to be flippant here because what is the meaning of begins there? Does it yeah. mean, well, it's the most fundamental belief they have? Well, that's easily shown to be utter nonsense um, because Augustine's point of departure is simply, as he tells you very early on, the Catholic faith is that there are three and one and the three work inseparably. That's his principle. OK, yeah, so okay. in terms of what's his fundamental expressed commitment, it's not about God being one. So you might say, aha, as is wrong because it's about Augustine's direction of travel. OK, so a nice example of this. If you read the way that Vladimir Lossky talks about Westerners, uh, not Augustine in particular, but, you know, Augustine is the sort of bete noir there. Um, you know, Westerners yeah. begin by talking about God as one, and that leads to them not taking the Trinity theory seriously. So they become deists, which leads to modern atheism, and then everything is Westerners' fault. OK, now, the very first theology book I owned was Lossky's Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church. So don't go telling me I'm dissing him. I love Lossky. But... When he writes about Westerners, it can be a bit tedious. Um, I feel the same way about Schmemann. I don't want to yes, get off on a yeah. tangent. I love Schmemann, but when he starts yeah. talking about Aquinas and stuff, he's talking yeah. damn nonsense. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Well, it's, you know, okay, that's a an... <gasps> deep breath. Don't get on that topic. Okay. No. So, but, but this isn't really so. You need to tease out what Augustine actually says. And I think there's been a range of people writing um, since... I don't know, the, the 1970s and 1980s, who've gradually really uncovered uh, or returned us to a picture of Augustine as this much more complex, more interesting figure. Um, so I, I wrote my book, um, The Great Michelle Barnes, who taught at Marquette, now in retirement. Uh, Rowan Williams wrote a couple of essays. It's been actually very important in English speaking uh, patristics, this recovery of Augustine, in which Augustine comes across as this oddly self-taught genius um very much yeah. embedded in the same sets of principles as greek theologians of the period but talking rather differently um just because he was writing in latin he didn't have their background he's often unaware of what they're saying um he's a, a hugely important for the west self-taught genius <coughs> well what would you make of the <clears throat> of the uh, distinction that I've seen often made is that Augustine's fundamental theology of the Trinity flows essentially out of some sort of psychological analogy or uh, by analogy with various faculties, memory, will, those sorts of things, uh, rather than with relational categories, as you would have, say, perhaps with, in the East. Uh, I feel that we should be holding hands and dancing around in a circle now, because <laughs> um, that's a bit like God, as you know. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> well, I, we can okay. sing a sing an appropriate song from the sixties. Yeah, probably written but written by a nun called Cynthia in about nineteen seventy five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Mark yes. Be like a praise chorus. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, Wearing denim of some kind. Absolutely denim. Yeah. I mean. Anyway, okay, let's stay calm. It's Holy Week. Um, let's yeah. be serious. Um, well, Augustine's psychological analogy is actually one of the most <clears throat> interesting topics. And I think the reason that it enters the sort of textbook is because people look to his long work on the Trinity, thinking that that's where you find everything he wanted to say. Um, and they don't look across the sort of broad sweep of Augustine's huge corpus of sermons and letters to see how he talks about the Trinity elsewhere. Um, and one of the things you would notice 
if you did that, is that the language of memory, intelligence and will is not, in Augustine, a common way of talking about the Trinity. It occurs in one or two sermons out of the hundreds that there are. Interesting. If you, want, if you, you, know, if you, if you want, OK, listeners, readers, viewers, if you want to go and get into Augustine on the Trinity, um, go to New Advent, where you can get most of Augustine's work in a fairly unpalatable old translation. Read the first three of Augustine's um, sermons on the Gospel of John, the tractates on John, and then read tractate number 39. That's where I would begin, and that's where I often begin with students. Tractate number book, 39. Okay, good. Yeah. He thought that his treatise on the Trinity was far too convoluted and involved and easily misunderstood. He's clearly unhappy about it. Um, he, he wrote 12 books of it gave it up for a long time. It was then stolen from him. We know this from a, a, from a letter. It was stolen from him and he felt the need to finish it. So he's very uncertain about this work. So the first thing is what he says there is not actually paradigmatic for everything he wants to say. It's much more interesting than that. But secondly, wow. secondly, even in that work, memory, intelligence and will are not really psychological faculties that are uh, fixed and that he's right. using to draw relationships with father, son and spirit, memory, intelligence and will along the bottom. I'm so glad um, you're, you're making this point, because when I read him, yeah. I, I, I had the same impression that yeah. these are not strict yeah. sorts of identifications. But anyway, go ahead. I interrupted. If you read book 14 of On the Trinity, if you're feeling you know penitential and you want something to do for Holy Week, um, mm -hmm. you don't have a farm to run. Um, one of the things you'll notice is he says, well, you know, let's think about all the different things that the mind does and let's end up with these three. Now, why does he end up with these three? He actually tells you uh, uh, elusively it's because in rhetorical tradition, uh, memory, intelligence and foresight were the three qualities that you looked for in a child to see whether they had the sort of mind that could be focused and properly educated. So they come straight out of Cicero, in fact. Um, and he says, but of course, memory, intelligence and foresight. Well, Christians don't have foresight. They don't know what's going to happen. All they have is will. And so he constructs this triad out of Latin rhetorical tradition to talk about the mind that is focused on a goal. Because as he says, you are in the image of God, not because you have memory, intelligence and will, but because your memory, intelligence and will can be focused on God, can love God. Well, OK, that, so that... he's actually doing something that's almost too clever for the work. He's picking on these three, three aspects of the mind's life and then emphasizing they're completely interwoven and inseparable. And yet they seem different. And then he says that's a bit like God. But, 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 but. He doesn't say it's an analogy. He says it's a similitudo, which in Latin yes. Yes. is the broadest category of likeness. In fact, he, he yes. denies it's an analogy because for him, that's always a proportion. There can't be it's any analogy between God and creation <clears throat> because you don't know by how much God transcends the creation. So, and I think what happens then is that Augustine's very experimental work um, gets interpreted as if it's a precise scholastic treatise and where he is using quite intentionally vague terminology that gets translated or taken, interpreted as if this is his analysis of the human mind um, and how it works. So it is it's rather different even if you look at the way that Thomas develops Trinitarian language on the basis of uh, knowledge and love, it has its own hugely significant power. Um, and it is in some ways Augustinian. You can see its inspiration coming from that tradition, but it's also radically different. Um, so yeah, Augustine's work is. in some ways had a huge impact and was hugely misunderstood. And that, that often happens, I think, in the history of theology that a work can be hugely influential, even as it's completely misread. Well, 
my my scholarly publications were neither in were, were not influential but were still misread so <laughs> <laughs> i misread and non-influential yeah, uh, <laughs> uh well that's uh, that's fantastic. That's why I wanted to have you on here because uh, I've spent most of my adult life with all kinds of bizarre stuff in my head about Augustine, and I yeah. and I can't. I've spent so much of my time focusing on twentieth century dense German gobbledygook uh, mm. that I I I'm I fall under the indictment of of the resource month guys that yeah. we were talking about at the beginning. You know, like I'm all about putting the systematic pieces yeah. that are all on the table and the jigsaw yeah, yeah. puzzle together no, but i but, I but think I, this is what see this is what resource more should do a resource more sh theology should be one which brings to light the sort of doctrinal riches of the patristic period and presents them in a fairly direct and clear way to the present um so how come it took me to retire from the academic world and to start blogging and video casting to suddenly rediscover that i've been well, full of cr crap the academic world will prevent you doing theology. I mean, it, it's the well, it does. prophylactic against theological thought in existence. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Or do we, yeah, do we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, I, and it, I, it begins with PhD training. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's get into this. I was going to go on to Nicaea. To hell with Nicaea. Let's yeah. talk about this. So this. And this goes back to, you know, another problem, I think, with all of our wonderful resource mon guys. They were members of religious orders. They had an incredible formation. They had a day-to-day -day liturgical life, which shaped them in ways that for the modern lay theologian, as most of us are, um, you, you're much more self-taught. You know, you have your own struggles amid family job, the rest of it to construct some sort of yeah. uh, prayer life as well. Um, and I don't think any of those people could imagine a world in which so many theologians would be lay people. I mean, I always, I sometimes taught when I teach a course on Catholic theology in the 20th century, it's always fun to ask the students at the beginning of a discussion of Vatican II, how many lay people were experts? And Very they'll few. all have guesses. You know, I'll tell them how many experts there were and they'll all have these guesses. And then of course the answer is, Zero. Yeah. It, it was even worse in the United States, Lewis. Yeah. I mean, I was reading Louis, uh, Joseph Pieper's memoirs, yeah. and he was talking about when he came to the United States, he was mm -hmm. absolutely shocked to find out that most Catholic universities didn't even have departments of theology, and that <laughs> all theology was taught in seminaries by by, yeah. by priests. And, and, yeah. and so that was the theological guild in the United States. Yeah. before the council and i know a lot of my uh, sort of rad trad friends who are very down on the council yeah. who are all lay people and theologians i say you wouldn't have existed in this yeah. idealized yeah. romantic yeah. church because yeah, as you just pointed is, out zero zero, zero. Yeah. the trouble is we're now into bizarro world where so many theologians are lay people without any formation so you know you get yeah. your formation by you know you do an undergraduate degree let's say you go you, you go to a nice christian college you go to you know even a pretty serious one you go to ave maria or hillsdale or thomas aquinas or whatever and you've got your degree and then you discover well, i'm pretty good at this so i'll go and get a master's and someone says to you why don't you get a master's from somewhere more important because it'll help you get into a phd program so, so go you, to duke so you pop off to duke or you go to emory or you know you go to Boston College or you go to somewhere like this and you do your master's and by the end of that you know you've you've had quite a lot of your faith beaten out of you and <laughs> you go into a PhD program and at that point uh, you go to Chicago or you know wherever and you do a PhD program where you learn that you ought to do something called constructive theology Right, because it needs constructing, because we haven't been thinking about it for 1900 years. <laughs> and yeah, we have to reinvent the wheel. We have to reinvent it. So your job as a junior theologian who's had a, you know, a fairly decent education, but you don't know much yet. You may never now have read more than a little bit of Thomas that you picked up, you know, way back when as an undergrad. Um, Augustine, yeah, you've seen him in some textbooks. Um and now your job is to make up some theology. Um, yes. yes. Is that, is that going to be a good formation? I suspect not, because it's yeah. not going to teach you 
to apprentice yourself to any of the great masters of the tradition in detail. That's the trouble. And it also actually gives you a counter apprenticeship in a form yeah. of discourse that is quite modern yeah. or postmodern, whatever you want to call it, yeah. that says that in order for it to be constructive, it has to be completely unique yeah. and original and pushing the envelope, yeah. Yeah. which means you have to open up ever new avenues of liberation or, or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but Cyril O'Regan, Cyril O'Regan has this wonderful way of talking about modernity, both as forgetting. Yeah. Misremembering. And, and as misremembering. Yeah. So that it's not that you don't try, you, you don't just forget. You also have a narrative of what went on before which sort of tells you that, oh, Augustine, he, he liked the unity of God, the Cappadocians, they liked three of them. And then along came smart people uh, in the modern world. And those are the people we really need to read. So you have this sort of construction of the past, which prevents you engaging it. And that's one of the things that annoys me. But it's not just, you know, the people who end up having a systematic training are part of the problem. If, if you get interested in historical things, you're more now I think likely to end up thinking of yourself as like a historian and less like a theologian. So you're right. not really taught to use those historical figures as living theological voices. So, you know, the field has become so discombobulated, dismembered, that it's very, very difficult, I think, for young theologians to be formed in a way that yeah. brings them into one common conversation about theology. So off uh, they go. Yeah. And then they get into universities, which are driven by universal university speak about what are the goods of education um, and what research consists in. Yeah, I think that uh, it's, it's more than a misremembering. It's a deliberate misremembering yeah. with ideological overtones, which is mm. why um, <clears throat> it is so difficult even for somebody who say who wants to stealthfully sort of form themselves under the tutelage of the of the great masters to decide i'm going to actually do historical research yeah. Yeah. uh it still becomes difficult for them to do that given the shoals that they have to negotiate the ideological shoals that they have to negotiate in the modern academy that is expert at sniffing out precisely that kind of wrong think uh, I, I i was once on a search committee at a previous institution of mine, I will neglect to say which. And we were looking for someone who was going to be called a systematic theologian. And I suggested somebody I really wanted us to interview. And for the record, it wasn't me. It, it wasn't Larry. No, no, <laughs> I mean, that would never happen. That was just, just embarrassing. But um, <laughs> It, um, this person had uh, ha had written some articles about the nature of truth. OK, um, so we had the search committee reading where we were trying to do the shortlisting and a, 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 a quite senior person who was chairing the, the search committee said, no, we can't interview this person because, you know, they're they're just obsessed with talking about what's true and not. And we don't do that any longer because that's that's very old fashioned. And we have a very different approach to what theology is. So I listened to this for a few seconds and then I said, but we've already got someone who's interested in those questions. And the, the chair said, but who's that? I said, me. <laughs> and then yeah. the chair said, laughed, laughed and said, well, that's fine, Lewis, but you're a historian. Wow. So it doesn't matter. So you oh. know, if you're doing history, it's fine. You can talk about any crap because it doesn't matter. Whereas if because, you're getting someone who is a theologian, then they have to fit the ideology of the the the, the context you're in. Oh, that's true, yeah. and uh, and 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 it's becoming ever more overt. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I I mean I despair for over the 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 state of modern PhD studies. Yeah. Um, because I I I don't know I I could go off on a tangent because a lot of the places that are not insane. Yeah. Uh, who are on a more, I don't know how to label it, more conservative trajectory. I don't know what, I, I, I hesitate yeah. to use these labels. Have doctoral programs that essentially, you get a doctorate as a reward for a life well spent. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, that, yeah. that, you know, it's, it's a gauntlet. It's almost as if they've gone to the other extreme. All right. We are going to formate you. So yes. you are going to learn every dadgum ancient language, and you are going to learn every <laughs> single thing that's ever been in yes. the church. And you're going to show proficiency in it. And it might yeah. take you 30 years to do this, but that's what we're going to force you to do. Yeah. And I don't think that that's necessarily wise. I'm like you. I'm not going to name mm. names of institutions no. that I have in mind, but I have some. We are in mind. so responsible. <laughs> it's, it's very impressive of us. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my wife might say that I'm just a coward who doesn't want to take the flack for. That may be wise too. Yeah. For naming for naming names. Okay, but yeah. okay, we we are now an hour but and this ten is, minutes. But this really is the problem. I think is. You know, I think it is. We're talking yeah. about something which to some people might seem a very sort of in shop bit of nonsense about how PhDs happen. But this is right at the heart of how will the church form theologians for the future? It's what's interesting. OK, let's and, and also not just theologians who are scholarly. We need those, yeah. obviously, someone like you who is just absolutely breathtakingly interesting i've so enjoyed this conversation i could talk to you for like three hours but we we won't uh, still we need theologians too who can translate that yeah in into uh, because we are now in a digital age as my friend mark stallman likes to say we're in a digital age and people a lot of people even scholarly people get a lot of their information through the internet through interviews like this and so on. And so, and so my point is this. I was I started my blog, GaudiumSpace22.com, basically just to give myself a sort of creative outlet. Mm -hmm. Let me just write like I used to teach my undergraduates. Yeah. And I'll toss some stuff out there. And bam, the thing caught fire. And I mm -hmm. and I I'm not saying this is a false humility. I could not figure out. what I was getting emails from people in Australia and England and France yeah, and Switzerland. Yeah. And it's like what in the heck is happening here? So a few people wrote to me and said, you don't understand. Very, very, very few people are out there translating the theology of up here into a language that people down here can understand. I mean, yeah. after all, who has been more influential, say, in the history of 20th century Christian writing? Uh, Chesterton Lewis or Rahner and Skillebex? I know that's an apples <laughs> and oranges. I know that's an apples and oranges because they're doing different things. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, I know people that would disparage a Chesterton or a Lewis, scholars, yeah. would, yeah. on the grounds that, oh, that's just popularizations. But I, I think that we need, I have to be careful I say this, and I'm dominating the conversation. I think people, there are too many books being written. And and I, once again, I think there's, that's something wrong with the modern academy and the modern guild. I think we need far, far more theologians out there in our universities who are able to teach and to teach undergraduates and, and to worry about and, and to let people like you write the scholarly books that I are agree. worth reading. Well, I mean, you're right. But this is another thing, isn't it? In order to get tenure, you've got to publish a second rate book with a third rate publisher. Yeah. Um, yeah. When if you are allowed to take 15 years, you might publish a first rate book. That's right. That's exactly and, right. You know, I think people of, uh, of our age were the last generation of people who were able at least to delay writing a book for a little bit. Whereas now <laughs> yeah. you've got to rush the damn thing out before you even know oh, yeah. what's in it. And, and it's and it works. Yeah. It can work with small scale historical studies. OK, I've written this book about Augustine's use of et in five sermons great okay so you know everything about that and that can work but the more constructive big dogmatic studies you shouldn't be publishing a book you should read some no, stuff exactly i mean i rushed my doctoral dissertation into publication as a yeah. book for just that reason oh i need to get something out yeah, there yeah, for yeah. so i can get tenure right away uh but the actual best book i wrote came 20 years into my career yeah. the book no, on science and religion true. you know and and there you go. So speaking of books, before we get out of here, I, I do want to turn to Nicaea uh, and your and your book on, on Nicaea. Get it out. Show the readers. Still in I've print, got, guys. You can buy some, it. It's somewhere back here. It's so on there it's somewhere. In all major airports. <laughs> Hudson News, I, they've always got 10 copies. <laughs> 
you, you, I, I have to have you back on because this this is great. We just I need to have Rodney Hauser get on here too. Yeah, that would, Rodney would be fun. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's 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 done some of these interviews with yeah. me, but uh, but anyway, Nicaea, specifically the last chapter of yeah. of your of your book on Nicaea. Can yeah. you kind of summarize what were your last what what was your last chapter about and why was it a little bit controversial? Okay, the the last the best way to understand the last chapter is that uh, a great uh, English uh, Orthodox theologian Andrew Louth wrote a book in the eighties called Discerning the Mystery. Read it, and in that book, with a lot of which is about the recovery of patristic exegesis, he says how difficult it is to sustain the idea of Christian doctrine if you don't have the methods by which Christian doctrine was arrived at. Okay, so if you can't read scripture in the way the fathers did, it's rather odd that you would hang on to the beliefs that the fathers derived from their reading of scripture. So I wrote this book uh, about the story of the fourth century and the development of the Trinity, and then how Greek and Latin Trinitarian theology is fundamentally the same, although there are differences. Um, And then the last chapter, I let rip really, to explain (laughs) how the modern sort of culture of systematic theology was really unable to engage patristic material properly. Because, you know, to give an example, it assumes there's a difference between historical theology over here and systematic theology over there, such that what you find over here is always something that needs to be translated or decoded or organized. Um, it's, It's a subject, systematic theology, which in its sort of more problematic angles tends to treat um, historical material as a subject to be dissected rather than um, an investigation of figures held up for reverence. Now, there are exceptions to that now. I didn't know very much when I wrote that book 20 years ago about the, the revival of modern Thomistic scholarship, which I think is a really interesting yeah. uh, different route taken. Um, So I I wrote that whole last chapter, which is quite long, um, attacking modern systematic theology as a fairly disastrous enterprise. Um, And it's only ever had two sorts of reactions from friends and colleagues who are systematicians. And one reaction is to say, of course, you're wrong, but it's very clever, meaning you're really wrong. Or they say, you're right, but we can't say that. Yeah. Now I've had at least t- I had at least two colleagues uh, from where I was teaching when it came out uh, who said, "Well, you're basically right, but I'm not sure what we would do about it." Yeah, my my reaction when I read it was first to pour an extra bourbon and d- dance a jig around the room because I thought <laughs> I had not yet met you. I don't think, and I thought, "I got I got to meet Lewis Air someday because uh, he just wrote what what I think." And uh, so maybe another category would be, "You're right." Uh, but but I don't know what in the hell to do about this now, other than yeah. to have that extra bourbon and d- dance a jig around the room. Because what you had was the nerve to actually treat the church uh, of that period as a as a church, as a church. as you know, as a com- as a community, yeah. uh, you know, with 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 a hermeneutical set of ideas. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, no, you're not allowed to do that. You're yeah. not allowed to do that. So, and that's why I said was, some have considered it controversial yeah. because uh heirs dares to hold to the idea that people back then maybe actually believe some stuff yeah uh, you know and that and that that mattered and that actually yeah. was kind of constitutive and determinative in, in some ways in ways though that we tend to read anachronistically and and not properly yeah, yeah. Uh, well I mean, we need we really do need to think about what i always call the theology of theology what is theological thinking why is it something Christians should do and how yeah. should we do it? And we've not we for, for 40 years, we've not been very good at thinking about that. There are exceptions, but for 40 years, it's been a problem. And I think that uh, as we wrap this up, one of the things that I'm coming more I've always appreciated this somewhat, but now I'm becoming to appreciate it in a very, very determinative way in, in my old age and dotage, which is the, the absolute importance of historical theology of the, of the kind that you do. Uh, 
I know my good friend, Dr. Bill Portier has always been telling <laughs> telling me you, you need to do more historical theology chap and i yeah. was like yeah 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 i got some german metaphysics to, to parts <laughs> here just leave me the hell alone about i'm busy isaac, with being yeah isaac hecker and crap like that i don't need yeah. to know about that uh so but i think that, that's why i really want I, I emailed you like a month and a half ago yeah. and we finally got it I, I, i'm so glad that you're on here yeah. it'd be great to have you back again maybe we can get hauser to come on yeah or or something a few months down the road. But anyway, I mean, do you have any parting shots, last words you want to leave with the viewers? We've been on here now about uh, an hour and 20 minutes, so we should probably wrap up. Yeah, we probably should. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this is the big question for everyone who's uh, viewing this, who reads theology. It's when you're reading a theologian, or if you're thinking about being a theologian, it's how, how do we think about theology such that when we read Augustine, we're reading someone who is a, a living voice in the church today, given to us by the spirit. He may also be someone who says all sorts of things that are just nonsensical. The arguments don't really work, but he's someone given to us by the spirit. He's not simply a dead white guy. If he was white, he's not simply a dead white guy that can be ignored. Um, and I think we have a real struggle to think about how we engage historical figures in the church as given to us. I think that is fantastic. And I think that's a great, great way to end this. And uh, I just want to thank Dr. Lewis Ayers once again. Please, if you are interested at all in, uh, in the history of Catholic theology and the history of Catholic ideas, why they're still relevant today, please get his book on Nicaea, uh, his book on Augustine. You have a, is your book on scripture out yet? I don't think so, right? No. Hey, look, you see, okay, here we go. Here's chapter seven. There it is. Oh, it's look in at draft. that. Growing old in the scriptures. Oh, uh, that's my that's my next purchase. Please, I hope it's not going to be $95, but we'll, we'll hopefully I not. hope so. I need the royalties. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Lewis Ayers. And, it was uh, fun, Larry. Speak okay. to you soon. All right. Let's uh, stop recording. <laughs>